Hello, I'm Molly Thomas, guest hosting for Lorna Duick. Today, rushing to respond amidst the rubble. What lessons have you learned in recovery? We talk about Haiti five years later. Five years have passed since a 7.0 magnitude earthquake rocked Haiti. Its epicenter was just 16 miles west of Port-au-Prince. Numbers only tell part of the story. 200,000 died, 300,000 were injured, and 1.5 million people displaced, with $9 billion in private and public funding pledged for its recovery. Today, guest host Molly Thomas joins Lorna to revisit the story and discover what's come of Haiti's recovery, what needs remain, and what lessons we can all take from its struggle to rebuild. Well, the last tremors of the Haitian earthquake subsided five years ago, but the even larger act of survival has continued long after the cameras left. And we'll hear from resilient Haitians later on. We'll also sit down with Lorna, who walked through that rubble five years ago. But first, let's turn things over to Sheldon Neal with some fast facts on Canada's commitment to Haiti. Thank you, Molly. Haiti is Canada's largest recipient of aid in the Americas. Long before the earthquake, Canada has been contributing to this country. Between 2006 and 2012, Canada gave a billion dollars in aid to Haiti. After the earthquake, Canada also pitched in 150 million for immediate humanitarian needs and another 400 million to support Haiti's national action plan. This money went towards food, emergency services, relief supplies, and water and sanitation projects. This year, Canada declared Haiti a focus country, but is currently reviewing its long-term strategy when it comes to funding. Well, Stephen Baranyi is with the School of International Development and Global Studies at the University of Ottawa. He specializes in Canada's policies in fragile states like Haiti, and he joins us now. Let's start with the good stuff. I want to know, what did Canada do right in Haiti's earthquake recovery phase? People in the Canadian government pledged over a half a billion dollars of immediate assistance after the earthquake, and better yet, it delivered. Canada is one of the few donors that delivered all of that assistance uh, within the two-year time frame that it was pledged for. Uh, moreover, Canada, the Canadian government and many NGOs that participated in the reconstruction effort actually uh, followed up on the projects, uh, the investments in uh, medical attention to survivors, in the housing of, uh, of persons displaced by the earthquake, and rebuilding schools, rebuilding hospitals, and longer-term development. Followed up on those programs and projects to ensure that they delivered results for Haitian people and uh, some accountability also to, uh, to Canadians. Now, Stephen, even with all of that, I mean, if we look at Haiti today, we see major political unrest, protests in the streets, most people living under $2 a day. I mean, if you had to rank our effectiveness, though, how did Canada really do? Well, I would rank it in relative terms, not in terms of some kind of ideal type of changing the world in five years, right? Uh, I would rank Canada as about 7.5. Why? full marks for all the good things that it did that, that I just mentioned. Uh, but on the downside, uh, Canada, like uh, some other donors, uh, has uh, actually channeled most of its assistance through Canadian uh, non-governmental organizations or NGOs, firms, international organizations like the UN, uh, and very, very little through Canadian, uh, Haitian rather, governmental or civil society, including church organizations. So very little to actually build Haitian capacity for longer term uh, disaster prevention and uh, development. Uh, secondly, uh, Canada, like mm, I would say most other Western countries, uh, really fumbled the handling of uh, its share, if you will, of handling the 2010-2000 uh, election. He, in fact, supported Mr. Martelli as a candidate. He came out victorious uh, in the second round. Uh, not surprisingly, he hasn't governed the country very well since. And two years after the election uh, victory, his election victory, Canada was disappointed and blamed him for all of Haitians' problems, called for more leadership, 
and called for results for development, even though we were channeling most of our money through our own organizations and international organizations mm -hmm. over which his government had no control. So politically, I think, uh, you know, we could have done uh, a, a lot better there too. Canada reconfirmed Haiti as a focus country this year. However, funding has not been committed yet. Do you think Haiti will always be dependent on countries like Canada? Um, sadly, that is a possible scenario, uh, but it doesn't need to be that way. It's not inevitable. Co several other countries in the uh, Caribbean and Central American region, like Barbados, like Costa Rica, even the Dominican Republic, have uh, greatly reduced their dependence on aid over the past decade. And they've done so by combining a market-oriented uh, growth strategy uh, with the social inclusion, government activism to promote uh, social, act social inclusion, inclusion of the poor and the benefits of economic growth, uh, liberal democratic politics, the rule of law. Uh, and Haiti has taken steps towards all of those goals too. So what do we need to do? I mean, that's the, the million dollar question, but what does Canada need to do right now? Well, right now, uh, as you may have heard, uh, on uh, January 12th, because the Parliament didn't adopt those laws, President Martelli uh, has constitutionally uh, the prerogative to rule by decree uh, as of, as of Jul January 13th. Um, so the first order of business for Canada and the international community uh, is to insist that uh, President Martelli uh, uses those uh, powers, those expanded powers, judiciously uh, and uh, reorganizes the free and fair uh, elections that he has promised. Even think, all of those, I mean, yeah. options, they all, they all demand money. I mean, how do you sell yeah. Canadian taxpayers on that? We actually need to invest more. That doesn't mean that we need to give a blank check. In fact, Canada has never given a blank check to, commu to uh, Haiti. But what we could do differently is, also, is channel more of that, uh, our funds through Haitian institutions, governmental and civil society, including church institutions in Haiti, while building their capacity to manage those funds responsibly. We have a moral duty to help uh, our brothers and sisters in need. I personally take that argument very seriously, too. Stephen, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Stephen Barani is an associate professor with the School of International Development and Global Studies at the University of Ottawa. Let's go to Sheldon now, who will tell us more about the Canadian most likely associated with the Haitian file, our former Governor General. Thank you, Molly. Mikael Jean has just completed her five-year term as UNESCO Special Envoy to Haiti. During that time, she has been a high-profile advocate for the country of her birth, spreading the word about the need and plight of Haitians. She recently spoke to a Toronto Star reporter and said this, I use every capacity I have to bring people together to work not for Haiti, but with Haiti. That's what partnerships are about. They are so tired of people doing things for Haiti. So with that in mind, we want to know from you at home, should Canada continue to play a role in Haiti's recovery? Email your response to comments at contextwithlorna.com or phone us at 1-800-215-4913. We love hearing from you. Coming up, we revisit a young Haitian hero five years later. I'm Rose Meter. I'm a mom, a wife, and an ER doctor in rural Canada. This year, my husband Rob and I have decided to take our four kids on a trip around the world. We have no idea what lies ahead. I'll be updating our journey on the Context with Lorna Duick website with blog posts and videos about our triumphs and trials and adventures. Won't you join us? This segment is brought to you by Bruce Etherington and Associates. Family harmony and philanthropy, helping you help others. Well, those who 
witnessed the destruction in Haiti five years ago will know how that country and its people can hold a special place in your heart. Now, Lorna and I have both had a chance to broadcast in that country. You were there, though, right after the disaster. What do you remember? Six weeks after, went in with uh, CBM, utter devastation and just uh, a smoldering crumble everywhere, and yet a few stark contrasts, enormous strong spirit of the people, and a few structures that had been built to code, like the old hotel I was staying in, mm -hmm. and the cell phone building, undamaged. So this sinking despair that it didn't need to be so utterly devastated. Well, Ed, it's really good to be back at uh, CBM. It's nice to have you back. I want to look back where you and I were five sure. years ago. Let's take a, take a look at this. No one expects to see money to a charity lost, but if you were one of the many who gave to build this school and therapy center in Haiti, your gift has had a heartbreaking ending. This was a school for about 100 physically disabled children. And uh, we're looking at what remains of the one wing of it. Um, they, the, the room above us that you see collapsed was the center or the hall where they had the TV in the center and at five o'clock they would have normally all been in there uh, watching TV. Luckily the power was out that day and so they, most of them were gone, but there were about six kids that were in there and quite frankly are in here. And you know, it's tragic. Uh, the six kids, three of them, they heard for a couple days crying, they couldn't get to them. And as you said, now that they've cleared the rubble on the other side, you know, we looked in and we found one of them, you know, the remains of one. Yeah, so this is what happened in this earthquake. It's, uh, it was such utter devastation. Ed, tell me what emotions go through your mind as you watch that back. I'm, I'm actually uh, amazed how moved I still am um, seeing that. I, you know, you process it for five years and you think it's over, but you go back and you see that, that footage again and you realize that, you know, there was a child of God that, in that rubble. And over 200,000. Mm -hmm. And we want to ask, how is Haiti doing today? And I, let's make it very personal here to CBM and the projects we worked on. So what, what happened? How, how, are, how is the need that that school served being served today? Yeah, there's, I mean, it's, it's terrible that things have to happen after an earthquake, but there are good things happening. If you take that school, St. Vincent, for example, there were 100 kids in there. Um, we took the opportunity to not limit the work we could to one school. And so after this devastation, when the school was destroyed, we said, let's work in the community and take our work into the community-based rehabilitation programs. And, and, and so now we work in Port-au-Prince, and in Port-au-Prince alone, there's about uh, 500 kids that we're working with, uh, with their, in the community, so in education, with their parents. The whole community is getting involved, so it's more than just one school. So we saw these, because the school was gone, that's where the disabled kids were kept. It got, you know, the care really got relocated to these tents. Remember, six that's weeks. Right. After the earthquake, it was just mm -hmm. a scrambling, get up these makeshift tents. Yeah. They've actually become rehabilitation centers. Rehabilitation centers that go out into the community, that find more people with disabilities. It's actually people with disabilities taking control of those organizations now, and we're stepping up to network these different organizations together. Um, it's working with communities and providing education for people with disabilities, access to education in the schools, healthcare, access to healthcare access to people for jobs, working with local Haitian businesses to hire people with disabilities. So out of that devastation came this brand new awareness of people with disabilities in the community. Okay, let's talk numbers first. So from the 100 kids who were cared for with disabilities in this school, yeah. how many now? Now there's about 500 in Port-au-Prince, and then outside Port-au-Prince is a 300 more. So there's about 800 that we're working with, and that's only in those centers. If you take all the recipients of CBM uh, serving in Haiti right now, it's about 60,000. Wow, yeah. so there's been 
not only a staying with the work of caring for people with disabilities in Haiti, but an expanding of it. Yeah. Tell me about recovery. Tell me about the changes you've seen in attitudes there. Well, one of the things that I remember when we went there, and this, these pictures remind me of it, um, we were wondering how attitudes towards disabilities might change. Because, because they were cursed. They were cursed. People with disabilities were cursed. They were written off, hidden. I, I don't know if you remember going to the tent cities. We didn't see people with disabilities until no. we asked, and then we, there were so many. Yeah. Going to the church service, we didn't see people with disabilities until, until they started coming. Yeah. Um, and that's how they were treated. Well, the earthquake changed that because every family, virtually every family has been touched by disability after the earthquake. And so they could no longer write a certain minority off. Attitudes had to change. And we were hoping that that would emerge, and it has. Um, we talked with a government minister at the time. You did a lot of networking to try and say, so give me an idea about infrastructure for, everyone's focused on rebuilding roads and so on, but actually attitudes and space for disabilities, did it change? I think that's been the biggest change that we have seen, and it's, it's, it's been very rewarding to see that because you can change infrastructure, but if you don't change attitudes, that's not going to catch. Development is so much deeper than just building a building. Development is long-term attitudinal change. And when people with disabilities are taking control of their own lives and of their children's lives, when people with disabilities are asking for their access to education and health, when people with disabilities are getting jobs from others, um, and, and being productive worker, it helps the whole society. And that's been amazing to see in Haiti, that, that change. We, don't, we hear all the bad news about Haiti, and it is a difficult place to work. But there are some amazing things happening from the grassroots up. We talked a lot at the time about God yeah. and suffering. And, you know, where, how do you answer these tough questions about God? I want to remind us about uh, Sebastian and how he was approaching his disability and the tough questions it raised for us about God. Watch this. Sebastian is another child who was buried beneath the rubble, trapped for three days. His Aunt Rose explains that Sebastian's mother died in the house. His father is still missing. Sebastian's own injuries were so severe, his leg required amputation. The solution for such loss, Sebastian asked to be taken to church to pray, to pray that God would grow back his leg again. And that was one of the toughest moments for me, mm. realizing a child's faith and then having to see agencies respond to how they would care. Where is Jesus in the long-term picture of disability care? I think Jesus is in the value of all people. We say that everybody is valued, like, should be valued like Jesus values them. Sebastian is valued by Jesus. The same if he has two legs or one leg. Somehow, when you work with people with disabilities and the community, you have to, if you can get that value for people, they feel valued, you're almost there. Yes, there are impairments that have to be fixed. You can get a prosthesis, and, and Sebastian does have one. Um, you can work with some of that, but if you don't get the feeling that they are valued by their friends, or they have friends, then I, I think that's where it, it will never heal. Uh, healing comes when people feel valued, and I think that's where Jesus is. And so as we look back on five years and we wonder, you know, uh, the fatigue of caring for a situation, what, what's your advice for how to stick with it? I think, again, go back to the example of Jesus. Jesus, everybody has value. Haiti is not over. Um, the, there's been a lot of good things happen in Haiti, but there's a lot more good things that need to happen. Um, and so they need the long-term concern from organizations and from people from Canadians, and if they have that, uh, it, it, many more amazing things can happen, but if they don't, then I, I think we haven't done our job. Uh, Jesus didn't cut and run, and we shouldn't cut and run either. Well, that's a good life lesson for any organization or country working in development. Now, Lorna, I know there was a little boy that really stands out in your memory, a really special boy. 
Rodinson went in after his whole family got out of this earthquake, out of their house, and Rodinson remembered that his little sister was still left in the house. And he chased back in, he saw she wasn't there with everybody else, and he chased in, and then there was another tremor, and the house ended up falling further, and he, it ended up amputating his foot, and he end, ended up with a little club foot. Mm. And so we followed him on the first um, painful steps of his first time with his crutches. And his dream was to be a professional football player, but um, obviously uh, Rodinson was adjusting to an enormous disappointment the day we encountered him with our cameras. We also have Musa Fadul in the audience, of course, uh, filming Rodinson there in Haiti. You guys were there together. Musa, what stood out to you about this little boy? I mean, you were trekking behind him with a big camera, but he's there with crutches going through all the debris. When we first met him, we arrived, he was in absolute shock. You can see he's totally sad. He didn't talk, didn't smile. His eyes were as if dead. Uh, but as soon as he realized that there's support around him, whether from us coming and greeting him or CBM showing support and care, uh, giving him the crutches, it was his first day on the crutches, mm -hmm. and he started making his way th on the streets of Haiti uh, through the cars this way or that way going back home, but without, without any hesitation, with determination, he wanted to make his way. So for me, that was a symbolic image of the resilience and the strength that this little boy had. And it seems like for me personally, as a photographer, the symbol and the face of what Haiti is, is facing, uh, a great tragedy, a huge tragedy, but at the same time with the resilience. Well, we had a chance to catch up with Rodinson, now 13 years old. And we may not be a, a football player in his future, but he has big dreams. Take a look. So I would like to be a civil engineer because I want to be able to make my own house. I want to be able to know that the structure is stable and I don't have to be worried about any corruptions in the construction. And I want to make sure that my life is safe and I don't have to worry about um, the construction of my house. And that's his little sister behind I him know. that he saved. Peeking out behind him and like, can you imagine if a new generation is coming up saying, I am going to build better. I'm going to build by code. I'm going to build, like, honestly, from the rubble of that, for a young boy to say, I'm going to be a civil engineer, doesn't need to be this way next time. Rodinson's mom, just as resilient. Um, you may remember she lost her husband, her job, her house in that earthquake. Mm. I asked her if she had any lingering questions for God five years later. Take a look at this. So I say thank you to God because without him, I wouldn't have Rodinson with me. There are people who died, who are people who are in worse situations. And I have to say thank you to him because without him, I wouldn't have Rodinson with me here. Pretty amazing, touching stuff. And, you know, faith is all through the people of Haiti. And I, I went there, one of the episodes we did was, where is God when there is suffering? And I was so you know, my North American mindset of this is so unfair. And there was just, there, there wasn't that kind of response. There was, we have lived, God has kept us and protected us, and we have a responsibility to recover from this. So there seems to be this disconnect from what you spoke about in the first part, where the government structure systems and the corruption um, is doing something at this level, but the Haitian person the mom, like Rodinson's mom, really wants to make uh, life different and is taking responsibility for her and her kids. And this is why it's so hopeful to partner with a charity that you trust mm -hmm. and a charity that stays on the ground. And so you're giving in relationship because they are following your gifts through with the ongoing work. It's mm -hmm. just fabulous. And the people have such a strong spirit. They want tomorrow to be different. And Lorna, you've been partnering with CBM for the last seven years toward mm -hmm. poverty relief. Um, in our audience today, we have Beth Joist Reimer here. She is the marketing director for CBM. Beth, we had a chance, I guess, to talk about the government contributions today, but maybe help us understand um, the pipeline to Haiti through a charity's perspective. 
international relief and development organizations like CBM, um, we, we are usually in country when a disaster hits. That's the way it was in Haiti. So we already had local partners already established, already proven for us, you know, Haitian colleagues, hospitals, clinics, ho schools, um, that we could turn to when the disaster hit, when the earthquake happened. So uh, these local partners were able to really very quickly help us to assess the needs, to plan meaningful response, really in collaboration with other organizations that were on the ground and together with grassroots with, with Haitian people. And, uh, and with any of our partners, we're also expecting that we'll get reporting back, right? So uh, dollars that are given here in Canada are reported back on. Uh, we can see the difference they're made, not just uh, the exact how the dollars are spent, but the impact that they have on real lives. So, you know, I've seen firsthand some of the differences made in, in the lives of kids like Rodinson. Uh, kids who can walk and go to school now, uh, despite crushed limbs in the earthquake. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I'm really here just to say Canadian dollars have made an a, a incredible difference and I really just encouraging people to keep being generous because the, the work's not done right uh, the country is still in need yeah thank you for being with us coming up why are we fascinated by growth out of destruction some final thoughts on that in Haiti next <laughs> Coming soon on Context, Commander Chris Hadfield takes over ground control at Context. Don't miss learning with us from Canada's best known astronaut. He tells how lessons in space give us tools for life on Earth. In every generation, all the way back to the great biblical flood, our culture is fascinated with new growth that emerges in the wake of destruction. Now we've witnessed fresh hope among survivors today and a heightened global awareness towards the needs of a struggling nation. Fresh new attitudes are emerging on issues such as disability. Now God's love can sometimes be hard to find in a disaster, but as Lorna and I and thousands of others can attest, his love through people can abound in the process of recovery. The closer you look, the more you get involved, the clearer it becomes. By the way, CBM is still on the ground in Haiti. Go to our web links to find out how you can encourage their good work for Haitians with disabilities. For Lorna Duick and everyone at Context, I'm Molly Thomas. Thanks so much for watching. Join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. Warren that I'm currently studying global affairs but I guess I, I think that it's just there is there is a role it's all connected I mean Chris Hadfield said that very clearly that we share this human experience and that I think um, what's happening in other places very much impacts how how um, life unfolds in Canada itself and I think all these questions about how we use this money properly um, those are good questions to ask it's not to ask them and then not contribute or not play a role it's to ask them and then work on them to make it better. I think it's always really important to be a good steward of your funds. It's always good to do your homework and want to see uh, hard-earned money used well. But having said that, there is always um, a need to relinquish some of that control. There's just That's the nature of giving, is a handing over. It's really important to recognize that we are all connected. We're not just in this little bubble, Canadian bubble. We need to make sure that we're expanding and we're also helping other countries. It's not too late to send us your comments. 
voicemail, email, Facebook, or Twitter. The conversation continues.